I think it was Christmas 1960 it started when I was given a copy of the Guinness Book of Records and sometime thereafter my mother drew attention to us that one of the entries in there was in fact my great 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 grandfather William Calcraft and he was listed in there as the longest serving public executioner. The criminals turned their faces towards the crowd below. The drop fell and justice had its due. Husband and wife were in an instant and almost without a struggle launched into eternity. It was something that really lay dormant in my mind for quite a long time, in fact till the early 1980s when I finally decided I wanted to look into my family and particularly find out if the story of the hangman in the family was was in fact a true story. I was living in Bristol at the time and I looked into reports of an execution there in 1849. The time of the execution had been brought forward to give him time to get to Norwich for the next execution on the following Saturday. He certainly travelled a lot by train and I've often sort of referred to his train travel as perhaps he was one of the earliest long distance rail commuters. When I first started to look into his career, one of the first discoveries I made was that during his period as an executioner, the Times newspaper in particular, as well as local newspapers, used to carry very good and often very detailed reports of executions. Over the years, I've compiled a list of some, I think it's over 900 executions during his period. Of those, I can place at least 300 or more into Calcraft's hands. Because Calcraft was a public figure, he featured in booklets and cartoons. And at the Taunton Record Office in Somerset, Richard Jeffries found a collection of letters between Calcraft and the governor of the local jail, detailing train times, fees, and even an expense claim for rope. It's actually given me the opportunity to put a lot of flesh onto the skeleton and to learn a lot about the person and, perhaps more importantly, a lot about where that person went and what he did. The hangman was very much a part-time job. He was employed by the city and paid a weekly wage, in fact, 21 shillings for doing that. But he was also a shoemaker. He must have had a very positive constitution, I suppose, to be able to regularly apply himself to a particularly grisly thing to be doing. Richard has travelled the country visiting the prisons where his great-great-great-grandfather worked. Here at Bodmin Jail, Calcraft executed two men in 1856 and 1862. As well as compiling his master list of hangings, Richard is now something of an expert on the mechanics of the Victorian execution. Calcraft, the condemned prisoner, sometimes the prison governor and the chaplain would have all come up onto the scaffold. At that point he'd have positioned the condemned under the noose and put the noose around their neck having strapped their hands. He would then usually place a cap over their head and the chaplain would often be saying prayers, might be the burial service for the dead. At an appropriate point, Calcraft would have moved over to the lever to release the drop, and at that point, if everything worked, then the prisoner would fall and be hung. For the most part, hanging was simply uh, slow strangulation in a noose of rope. It was a slow, uh, painful, extremely distressing way of killing people. 
Calcraft became one of the first of the sort of um, uh, publicly known public executioners. And thereafter, it became a much more professional business. It's reported that Calcraft would go underneath and swing on the legs of the person to ensure that the hanging was successfully completed. People were dying in great agony in public, often being jeered on by a drunken crowd. And that wasn't a particularly edifying spectacle. And it certainly offended the uh, sensitivities of quite a number of people. On the whole, Victorian society by the 1860s said, look, this is pretty disgusting. You know, we really don't want it. Uh, so it was a remarkable time of transition of law reform and also of penal reform, of course. During the 19th century, 300 capital offences were gradually reduced to four. And in 1868, the Tory government finally abolished public hangings. The last public execution in England took place in May 1868 in Newgate and was carried out by Calcraft. The condemned prisoner on that occasion was a person by the name of Michael Barrett and it was in the August of 1868 that Calcraft was called on to carry out the first execution under the new regime where it was held within the confines of the prison. William Calcraft, shown here in his 60s, continued hanging people for another decade. Richard's fascination with his ancestor has become a permanent feature of family life. His children have got used to their holidays, featuring visits to prisons and cemeteries. They probably at times have felt that I, I've become a bit obsessed with the subject. What sort of views have you got as to what he did and what sort of a person perhaps he was? As I got older, I thought it was quite sad. I thought it was quite sick, yeah. <laughs> but there we go. I think it was a job, so he had to do it. It's like anything, it's a job, and he, yeah. it's what he was doing, and it really helped him earn his living. But on the other side, I think it was quite a disgusting job to do. It used to be quite scary when I was younger, because obviously... Yeah, I think it, I don't know if it's scary, or it's just plain embarrassing <laughs> to have friends around, and it's like, oh, this is my dad, and, oh, his hobby isn't fishing. No, no, it's hangmen, it wasn't murders. That's sort of slightly sordid. But if he'd just been a shoe, shoe mender, would we ever have found... We wouldn't have found him in the Guinness Book of Records, would we? No, and no, this is true. We wouldn't have found it, all the references to him in newspapers and other places. I guess, guess it's an interesting talking point when you get to history at school and have to draw your family tree. And I'd say probably all of us can draw our family tree back a reasonable way. I guess it's made the whole sort of history thing seem slightly more worthwhile. It's brought it more alive, perhaps, wasn't it? He actually retired as a hangman in 1874, and he died some five years later, towards, I think it was the December of 1879. Richard's investigations have recently led him to discover William Calcraft's last resting place, the now disused and overgrown Abney Park Cemetery in North London. Well, this seems to be the family grave of William Calcraft and his wife, Louisa. Although it describes it as a family grave, it doesn't actually say if William himself was buried in this grave, rather surprisingly. Although from the inscription at the top where it says family grave of William Ong and Louisa Calcraft, I suspect that this is where he was buried. It's quite a sort of almost moving moment, sort of having been following William and his family over the years to actually be sitting here by, by this gravestone and realising that this is their final resting place and uh, it's set here in a rather quiet and, albeit overgrown, but rather peaceful setting, which uh, make, makes it all a rather almost moving experience. I've been doing this now for some 17 or 18 years, and I suspect that I'll probably still be doing the same thing in another 17 or 18 years' time. <laughs>